2022 is winding down, and it's been one hell of a year for film. We got Nirvana back on the charts with The Batman. We got the fantastically poignant The Banshees of Inish Erin by, uh, my favorite director. And we got one of the best surprises of the year with Prey, being one of the greatest sequels never to be seen in cinemas. Seriously, Hulu? You should have had at least a limited release with that one. But there's only one movie that came out this year that I really wanted to talk about. One that really speaks to the ennui of contemporary life. No, I said this year. We're not talking about Eyes Wide Shut. I told you. Well, what then? Not publicly. How did you get all of them? Stop it. No, we are not doing Airbud yet. I had a whole thing set up, you know, all that stuff, but he decided to just roll the title card. I will deal with you later. Everything Everywhere All at Once was directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert, who go by the professional name Daniels. Get it? Because they're both named Daniel. It's fun. After directing several short films, they got their start working steadily as directors of music videos. Foster the People's Don't Stop Color on the Walls, Joy Wave's Tongues, and probably most famously, DJ Snake and Lil Jon's Turn Down for What. In these three music videos alone, you get a couple things that keep reappearing in their subsequent filmography. A subversion of authority figures, frenetic energy, and surprising emotional connections. After spending time in 2013 directing several Adult Swim staples, such as Children's Hospital, NTSF SD SUV, and one of their infomercials, Broom Shakalaka, which slaps, they moved on to features with their 2016 directorial debut farting corpse Daniel Radcliffe movie, Swiss Army Man. And in 2022, they released their most recent and best work yet, Everything Everywhere All at Once. The film stars Michelle Yeoh as Evelyn Wong, an overwhelmed laundromat owner who is an immigrant from China. Ki Hui Kwan, famously short round, comes out of essentially retirement to play her husband Weyman. Stephanie Shu plays Joy, her rebellious daughter. James Hong, Lo Pan himself, plays Gong Gong, Evelyn's father. And Jamie Lee Curtis rounds out the cast, playing an IRS auditor named Deirdre Bobirdra. According to A.O. Scott of the New York Times, someone who I find pretty pretentious but has some good opinions every now and then, he says that this comedy, sci-fi, action, fantasy, martial arts film is a swirl of genre anarchy. And I couldn't agree more. Everything Everywhere All at Once is about how Evelyn finds out that she is living in one universe surrounded by an entire multiverse, where there are different variations of herself living in other universes. Not only that, but she, this version of Evelyn, is the only person who can save the multiverse from total collapse. And she's able to do this by tapping into the versions of her in other universes who have accumulated skills and is able to use them in her universe. Very the matrix of them. But it's also none of that. Really, that crazy action sci-fi stuff is just the frosting on the cake that hides a deeper, richer narrative that allows for audiences to actually find emotion, catharsis, and acceptance in this insane world we live in. I could ramble on and on about this movie for hours. I literally wrote a 5,000 word essay about why this movie was great in my first draft. And I touched on everything. The writing, the filmmaking, the pacing, the martial arts, the set dressing. But I just kept coming back to the real thing that I wanted to talk about. The themes and how it can be interpreted. So if you'll indulge me, I'd really like to dig deep and talk about what this movie is saying, what it means to me, and why even watching it for the seventh time now still has the emotional power that it did 
as the time that I saw it the first time in theaters. Let's start with how Daniels deliver exposition. Exposition is just a fancy term for information the audience needs to understand a story. It could be backstory, it could be plot details, it could be rules to the film, like in a movie like Everything Everywhere All at Once, or horror movies especially. But you don't want to just outright tell them what's the information they need, or else it's not entertaining, it's just dull. So the key is making exposition engaging to the audience. And the way good writers and filmmakers are able to bring exposition to the audience in a fun way is visually, through conflict, or through characters' actions. How do we learn about Evelyn's character and how she deals with things in the beginning of the film? Through a frantic startup of her day as a laundromat owner. We see her dealing with business struggles, the impending audit, her daughter bringing her girlfriend over and she isn't really fully comfortable with that yet. Her doting husband who seems to be too playful and she pushes away. And her preparations for a Chinese New Year celebration. She never outright states any of her frustrations aloud. But as we follow her, we understand it all. We get the idea of how the multiverse works in this film through a flashback that goes through her entire life story in a very frenetic, visual, entertaining way. Showing that there are key moments in her life where she made choices that could have gone one way or another way, and those branches leading her to being a laundromat owner who is being audited. And we learn about the concept of verse jumping through Wayman's explanation of the concept, only after we get to see it done visually in an action scene, thereby only using dialogue description, which is presented it as a tense, we have to be quiet because people are after us moment, to give us the audience context of what we saw in the previous scene. So with the exposition and setup of verse jumping, doing something random that would be improbable in any given situation, that allows you to access the memory and skills of you from another universe, established, along with the risks that come with verse jumping if you do it too many times without fully centering yourself back in your own universe. Let's discuss the conflict. Alpha Wayman states that the entire universe is at risk due to the actions of Jojo Siwa. No. Um, tapioca? Jobu Tapaki is a multiversal consciousness that is attempting to end everything, everywhere, all at once. And once Evelyn is confronted by Jobu Tapaki, she realizes that it's her daughter Joy from another universe. It turns out in the universe where they learned about multiversal travel, Evelyn pushed her daughter too hard where her consciousness shattered and so she is now everywhere, experiencing every universe's version of Joy all at once. Through the help of several of her alternate selves, Evelyn is able to become a master martial artist, a blind singer, allowing her to hold her breath and eyes while she fights during a tear gas attack, a sign spinner using her skills to use a police riot shield like a sign, and a master hibachi chef which she uses to fight Jenny Slate's dog mom and her retractable leash. <laughs> But when Evelyn realizes that in order to stop Jobu Tapaki, she may have to kill her joy, she refuses. Because she's so uniquely skilled at verse jumping, because as Wayman says it, she is so bad at everything that she is able to be good at anything, Evelyn decides to verse jump into as many of her alternate selves as there is possible. Because she feels the only way to be able to stop Jobu is to become like her. So so she jumps and she gains all of the knowledge that all of her alternate selves have until she collapses of having the weight of her consciousness fracture into so many pieces. Then the movie ends. Yeah, I know, it doesn't actually end, but the first part ends and we get into part two everywhere. Now it's Christmas time, and my siblings enjoyed this movie as much as I did. So I went onto Etsy to try to find something everything everywhere all at once themed to get them for Christmas. Something that speaks to the profound nature of the film and really, you know, it's fun, that makes you chuckle, makes you think. But I kept on seeing things that were focused on the line, just be a rock. And I think 
if you watch this movie and you come away with that is the most profound line in the film, I appreciate you have good enough taste to realize that this is a great movie, but I'd like to beg you to think a little deeper. Because, see, after Evelyn dies, at the end of part one, everything, she becomes like Jobu Topaki, and her consciousness is sent into every version of herself at the same time. She is everywhere. And in order to understand the themes of the film, let's briefly talk about where everywhere sent Joy. Joy, as Jobu Topaki, experiences everything in every conceivable universe at the same time. In her search for meaning or reason for being, she has found nothing. So, like many people who find the weight of existence exhausting, she puts her time into arts and crafts, creating a bagel. She puts everything on it. Literally everything conceptually she puts onto a bagel. Every breed of dog, every Craigslist ad, all her hopes and dreams, everything is on that bagel. And with this cosmic bagel, which is essentially just a black hole that will suck everything into it, she doesn't want to destroy the multiverse. She just wants to destroy herself. And honestly, the more you learn about Joe Tapaki, the more empathy you feel for her. She isn't evil. She's just exhausted. And I get it. Her search for Evelyn? It's not to kill her, it's to find a kindred spirit, someone who can see the multiverse the way she sees it, and try to tell her that she's wrong and that there is meaning out there. When she finally realizes that Evelyn sees the same empty, meaningless multiverse that she sees, Jobu Tupaki decides that the bagel is her only chance at peace. And in her search for meaning, she found none, leading her to a very nihilistic view of the world. Now, nihilism is the philosophical theory that states, simply put, life is devoid of meaning, purpose, or value. And we can see how that when you look and you can see universes where you are a luchador, a prison guard, a professional golfer, a piñata, a rock, and you're experiencing these all at the same time. You can find that any choice that you made to branch your life out into whichever way that it could possibly end up, it feels kind of meaningless. Like if you realize that you are just the result of every choice you've ever made, and there's another version of you that's made the opposite choice in every choice you've ever made, branching out into infinity, and you can see all of it, there doesn't seem to be any purpose of existence in that sense, and I get it. And so, when we find Evelyn and Joy in a universe devoid of life, they are, rocks. And Joy tells Evelyn to just be a rock. We can see that it is her coping mechanism. She found a place where, even for just one moment, she doesn't have to be anything, she doesn't have to do anything, she doesn't have to care about anything. She can just exist. But here's the thing to ask yourself. Who is the character saying just be a rock? It's the antagonist, Jobu Tapaki. So taking this nihilistic view as the meaning of everything everywhere all at once is just as misguided as those that take the meaning of The Last Jedi to be let the past die, kill it if you have to. Maybe it's not as nefarious, maybe it's not as antagonistic, maybe it's not as annoying on the internet, but it's still misguided. So I reject this nihilistic reading because that's not what the film is saying and the line comes in the middle of the movie. Most movies, most good movies that are about something and are trying to say something deeper with their themes, they're structured like an argument. Think about war movies. Look, I promise it's going to connect, just let me have this one. In many, if not most, war movies, the theme War is Hell can be seen as prominent. Saving Private Ryan. War is Hell, but sometimes things are worth dying for. Black Hawk Down. War is Hell, but the soldiers are heroes. Dunkirk. War is Hell, and Time is Weird. But if you were to make a movie that was just war as hell, that would be one note and dreary. It's like an English class. You've got your thesis, 
and your antithesis. So for every D-Day scene in Saving Private Ryan, you've got the small moments showing the humanity and the camaraderie of the soldiers we're following. So for everything everywhere all at once, what would be the thesis to the nihilism antithesis? Well, the film doesn't outright deny that there is no meaning to life, it sort of embraces that fact. But it delves further into the great meaninglessness of existence and emerges on the other side into absurdism. While absurdism does contend that there is no objective meaning to life and that existence is absurd, the philosophy does not preclude the conscious thinker from finding subjective meaning in arbitrary places. And to highlight the absurd absurdist reading of the film, I'm going to focus on three aspects that directly show that the argument Daniels is making in this piece is that even when feeling small and insignificant in the grand scheme of the universe and the cosmos, we can choose to find meaning in the small moments, the people we love, and the things that make us happy. The first example of this can be seen in the first shot of the film. Not only is it a brilliant example of creative filmmaking that the directors will bring to the rest of the movie, it just has so much going for it in regards to the themes. It's nighttime and we get a slow zoom into a mirror in a cluttered, disorganized corner of their apartment. It's full of trophies, family photos, books, raccoon statuettes, essentially memories. And in the mirror, we get a glimpse of Evelyn, Waymond, and Joy singing karaoke and smiling with each other as a loving family in slow motion. Then we get a sharp match cut to daytime and we zoom into the mirror and we see Evelyn start her frantic day surrounding by the taxes. But this shot sets up the entire movie. A moment of joy is captured in a tiny mirror surrounded by clutter accumulated from an entire life. The slow motion is clearly highlighting the important part of the scene, the important part of the movie, and the important part of life itself. Time spent with those you love. And we can get lost in the hectic nature of existence if we don't cherish those small moments in time. So now let's talk about the heart of the film. Evelyn, in the second part of the movie, is living so many different lives as she bounces around the multiverse. And while that's happening, Jobu Topaki's words of nihilism start to creep into her. She begins to reject things that used to matter to her. Her marriage. Her laundromat. Her family. She gets lost in the multiverse and begins to take self-serving actions that harm everyone around her. She makes her co-worker at a restaurant lose his best friend. She ignores Deirdre, whether it is the tax auditor or her lover in the universe where everyone has hot dogs instead of fingers. And she makes a move on another universe's Waymond without thinking of his feelings. She sees the pointlessness, the existential dread of just going around in circles doing laundry and taxes and laundry and taxes year after year. But at her lowest point of the film, when she's about to give in and go with Jobu Tupaki, the heart of the film takes prominence. Waymond, in a universe where Evelyn decided not to go with him to America and they both became relatively successful, he says to her, in another life, I would have really liked just doing laundry and taxes with you. This, this moment where Evelyn, whose regrets have fueled her to this point, she sees that even when you make the right choices and become a success, you might not have made the right choices because you have isolated yourself. It is right here where she chooses no longer to fight with violence, but with kindness and compassion. And in doing so, she tries to find her own meaning in her insane existence as a multiversal entity. After remembering why she fell in love with Wayman in the first place, during his speech about being kind, especially when we don't know what's going on, Evelyn decides to go after Joy, who is attempting to swan dive into the oblivion that the Everything Bagel holds for her. And she has to get through a whole bunch of people who are trying to stop her from stopping Jobu Tupaki. Instead of fighting, she decides to use her new abilities to help everyone around her. She travels the multiverse as she scales up the stairs, leading to the Everything Bagel, and she gives every enemy combatant 
fulfillment. But when she tries with Joy, Joy rejects her. This is the point in the climax where, in any other movie, that would be anything like this. There isn't anything like this. There's just this movie. But in any other movie that has this sort of themes, where Evelyn learned her lesson and decided to become a better person, she should win. But in this movie, she doesn't. And Joy goes into the bagel. However, Evelyn learns that being kind doesn't just mean being a pushover. So she takes a firm but loving stance. She is able to reach joy using her own words, saying that she will cherish the time that they have together. Evelyn has seen the multiverse, seen every iteration of herself, and she has decided that she wants to do laundry and taxes and make the most of her time in the universe and with the people who she chooses. And now before I leave you, I want to give you a top insert number later of the things that I love about this movie that I couldn't really fit specifically into the essay. The martial arts. How could that not be first? Michelle Yeoh is great and her skills are on full display. The fact that it's not just bilingual because they speak English and Mandarin just back and forth so quickly, it's also trilingual because Gong Gong speaks Cantonese. Every single subplot set up has a payoff that is emotionally resonant. The match cuts. The absolutely gut-wrenching look that Waymond gives Evelyn after she first verse jumps into a universe where she didn't go with him and she became became a martial arts success, and she says that she saw a life where she didn't stay with him and her life was amazing. The costume and hair and makeup departments. Seriously, these guys are on point. The song, absolutely, Story of a Girl. By Nine Days, being played almost imperceptively throughout the film, after Wayman's line of, Your clothes never wear as well the next day. Your hair never falls in quite the same way. The moment in the office where all of the alpha verse people are preparing to verse jump and it's just chaos and random and I love it. The fact that there is no villain of the piece as Jobu Tupaki, while an antagonist, is just an antagonist because she has different goals, not because she has any malice in her heart. The sound effect drop of the Super Smash Brothers baseball bat whenever the pinky uppercut is used. <laughs> Randy Newman's voice performance. And of course, this cannonball onto the trophy. Everything Everywhere All at Once is cinema. It's one of those rare movies that come around once a decade, maybe, if you're lucky, that reaches deep into your emotional core and gives you just what you need. And I haven't even mentioned that it's probably much more relevant to immigrant and Asian American communities because, look at me, but I'm sure that movie is even more resonant to those communities and definitely search them out if you want to get a deeper reading on this film as there are so many more cultural aspects that probably went over my head that I don't understand. Everything Everywhere All at Once is hilarious, emotionally resonant, and deeply life-affirming. It tells us that we don't have to be alone, that people are stupid, but we should be kind if we can be, and that we can look into the face of oblivion and laugh. And isn't that just a great way to live? Don't hate. Nothing matters. What do you mean? It's just not how this works. Anyway, thank you for watching this essay. I loved this movie when I first saw it, and I loved this movie the seventh time I saw it while writing this essay. I hope you liked my essay. I put a lot of work into it, and I appreciate you watching this. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, do all that YouTube stuff. I say it all the time. Do the comments, or whatever, I guess. I love you all. Happy Christmas, Merry New Year, and I hope 2023 is another great year for film. Always remember, nothing matters.